primarily what we do is we work with thousands of hyper-local organizations, community centers, libraries, small local charities, um, to engage people where they are. Um, and uh, in the last 10 years, we've supported 3.4 million people. So I talk about this as being deep impact at scale. So it's important, I think, to set the scene because digital exclusion and the digital divide is such a, a broad area. Um, so um, when I talk about closing the digital divide, I mean closing it for children and for adults, so all ages. But also during the pandemic, there's been a lot of discussion around devices and data. So yes, you need a device, so be that a, a tablet or a laptop. You need um, connectivity to the internet, be it mobile or fixed line. You need the skills and confidence to be able to use the internet well and to use it safely. Um, but also you need to have that purpose to embed it into your life and to continue to use it and to have that continued support. So in the UK, there are 9 million people who are adults who are digitally excluded. Um, and it's important when uh, we talk about digital exclusion, we don't think of this as something that's binary. It's not like you're either offline or online. I guess the metaphor of the digital divide doesn't really help there. It's not like you'll just cross over and then everything will be fine. You need to make sure that, that obviously people have all of those things, the skills, the will, the device and the connectivity. Um, that they're in the it's massively aligned with um, poverty and, and income levels. Um, a quarter of children in the lowest socioeconomic groups during the pandemic um, started out without access to the internet and without a device. And there's also a north south divide. So, for example, in the southeast of England, 49% of adults are what are called extensive internet users. But in the northeast of England, that goes down to 18%. So it's not okay that we live in the fifth richest country in the world um, and that we still have poverty, digital poverty, data poverty, the digital divide in such an extent. We did some public polling and 61% of the public um, thought that the internet should be a utility like water and electricity. Um, and 78% said that um, the importance of digital skills had raised in their own lives. So I think that we're now going out of what you know has been called the emergency phase or the warrior phase, um, and that we're now entering into a sustainable phase. So what do we want to happen next? Um, we know that it's going to be absolutely essential for building back better or for the recovery that we do close this digital divide. Um, and I think we should set ourselves an ambitious target. Um, I think that we should look to fix the digital divide for all ages um, in this decade. Um, and to do that, we need a single coherent plan, um, not a thousand flowers blooming. Um, that the, the reason I say that is because um, in, an, in the emergency phase, there's been so many um, initiatives and products and, and, and really, really well-meaning, excellent initiatives. But now we need to go on to that sustainability phase. So we need a single ambition. We need a single coherent plan. And I think the government needs to lead this. At the moment, um, DCMS leads digital inclusion as a policy area, but clearly DFE works with children and DWP, with people unemployed um, and with older people. So we need a national plan that's cross-government. I mean, I would say led by number 10. That, that by saying that government should lead it, I'm not saying that the, the business sector doesn't have a role. This absolutely should be a national plan that's led by government, but also delivered cross-sectorally by businesses. Um, so all of you, if you're working in a business, can encourage your businesses to see this as a priority for them. So it's great that the BCS has it as a priority, but business can have as a priority too. So it's not just business, it's not just government, it's clearly um, myself, the charity, you know, the charity sector has got a role. Um, and we need to make sure that we all collaborate together and fix the digital divide, but give ourselves that, that time scale and make sure that we're not duplicating, that we're collaborating at both the national and at the local level. So I'm going to stop there, John, but happy to take questions later. Thank you very much, Helen. You uh, set the scene for us very nicely then. I I too am a big fan of, of a single coherent plan. I thought that was lovely. And I, I really liked your skills, will, devices and connectivity. I think that's a nice way of capturing it. So thank you very much for setting the scene so well for us there. Uh, Danielle, over to you, please. 
Thanks very much, John. Thanks, Helen. Um, as, as John said, I'm uh, president of the IET this year in our 150th year. Um, so, so it's very special year. I feel very honoured to do it. Um, I'm also a professor of electronic engineering at the University of Manchester as well. So with both of those hats on, I'm extremely interested um, in this topic. Um, the IET is a global institution and, and many of you might be members um, as well as being members of the, the BCS as well. We have over 160,000 members in around 150 countries. And what we want to do is pr promote the increasingly diverse, innovative and multidisciplinary nature of modern day engineering and make sure we secure solutions for the world's greatest challenges. And of course, this includes uh, digital futures and, um, and digital, the digital divide as well. Now, the, this challenge um, of you know, tackling the digital divide obviously is far too large for one organization to take on alone, which is why the IET with our partner, the Learning Foundation, uh, we're working to establish an alliance with organizations um, who can work together and, and tackle a challenge. So we've, we've just very recently formed something called the Digital Poverty Alliance, the DPA. And this is really aimed at tackling that issue of the digital divide and ending digital poverty for all. What, you know, as Helen said, this is, this is not just a, um, a next generation issue, this is an adult issue as well, but we are particularly focusing on disadvantaged children over the next five to 10 years as well. So why is the IET um, establishing the DPA as well? Um, well, within, within the IET's uh, charitable objectives, we talk about promoting the general advancement of science, engineering and technology. Um, but if many people, many children especially, um, who, you know, if they don't have that digital means to access our STEM initiatives, there's a whole demogra demographic with whom we are unable to engage. Um, and this is a real challenge for us. And, and so we want to be able to make sure we tackle that challenge as well. So I'm really looking forward to, to exploring the opportunities on the role of professional bodies um, and how individual members of, of all professional bodies can make a, a positive impact to close that digital divide. Thanks very much. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, you can hardly promote general advancement of science, technology, and say, oh, but not you, nine million. Sorry, you know, we're not yeah. including you guys. Uh, it's only those that are there already. And it doesn't quite work, does it? So, uh, Freddie, uh, please, your your contributions to this uh, kickoff discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to um, not only represent myself as an individual who is sort of curious, wanting to, to understand what we can do about digital inclusion, but also other individuals who are in this space because I've spoken to a number and you know and also all the um, sort of local great local initiatives uh, regional initiatives that's already happening um, but also to take this opportunity to thank the tech uh, communities that I'm part of UK IT leaders Horizon CIO network Society for Entrepreneurial Education and Development CIO water cooler hot topics computing tech monitor charity IT leaders but last but not least also BCS I've been a member a fellow member uh, for and a member for 30 years. Um, and finally, I feel like at least maybe I can do something for my profession, not on my own, but together with my fellow IT uh, professionals, because when we started asking the question, what can we do uh, to help? It's very interesting that um, everybody says we must do something. But then when you ask, what, what can we do? What should we do? It becomes a question mark. So what it is, what, what is it? And how do we start? And, and this, this COVID period has, has made many of us take our social responsibilities more, more seriously for myself as a tech leader, but also as a parent. I've got two young children. I am really concerned about not just for them, but also that generation of kids that's going to go through this period. Right. So I think there are many, many reasons why we all want to do this. And my story starts by, you know, uh, 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 one of the, the soft IT leaders uh, asking for help to say, hey, Freddie, can you help to donate some money, use your social media to get people to pay attention to this, donating some equipment to Northeast of England because it's one of the most deprived part of the country, if not. We're talking only about three schools, 160 equipment. And you know what? It was really hard work. It was so hard to raise money, enough money to satisfy a few laptops, let alone, you know, 160. And then the more I talked to other leaders, including, you know, uh, Anthony Nolan, which is a, a, a charity, you know, the CIO there, Danny Altier says, it's hard work. That is their job. It's hard work. 
the more I talk to people, the more I realize, we all realize that actually donating equipment is the most obvious place to start. But is it the right place for all of us to start from that place? And not only that, is it, does it go far enough? Right? So I started talking with um, my, 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 my sort of communities and asked them for help. And everybody says, uh, Freddie, why don't you go and find out this information? And this is how this whole information collection exercise started. You know, back in uh, January the 12th, over six weeks, um, we basically asked, I basically asked two questions. Yeah, find out who is already doing something and also who would like to help. And the responses was, they were overwhelming, right? So from talking to a few people, it became across nine communities including the BCS who sent out a newsletter to 60,000 members in total representing 90,000 tech professionals. I was connected also with other uh, sort of partners already involved in this space, uh, you know, the Princess Trust Business in the Community, Positive Transformation Group, Open UK, Flying Binary, Social Mobility Pledge, Verizon, AWS, STEM, Raspberry Pi, lots I can go on, right? And in turn, we were also connected to, you know, Helen, like the Good Things Foundation, uh, the World Triple Company of Information Technologies, ASA, Again, lots more, right? So directly I've spoken to 60 individuals, uh, received more than hundred responses and they represent in total 80 organizations. And I've also counted there are more than 70 initiatives doing equipment donation, right? So I was really overwhelmed by the support. And in fact, this panel today is a testimony to how the tech profession has come together so quickly to try and do these things. And what we did was not to try and replicate by creating another organization. It's just, we call it joining the dots, right? Because this is a very grassroots attempt to just talk to each other and say, hey, who is doing what? And all we want to do is to help to sign posts for other tech professionals. That is our uh, sort of a starting scope, right? Just for tech professionals to know where to start, to either help themselves or help others as an individual or as part of their company uh, uh, CSR responsibilities or as part of any sort of professional bodies like the BCS and, and those uh, tech communities I mentioned. So therefore, I particularly welcome today's event because it's a combination of both sort of bottom up as well as top down because we need to join it up together. I was really delighted to find out what the IET and the BCS and others are doing in terms of this digital poverty alliance, right? Because what it does is that it's not, it's trying to help to provide a steer. You know, with somebody, you know, we talk about having a national approach. National doesn't mean just the government, right? National means we have a holistic and systemic approach to hopefully solving this problem in a way that is sustainable and, and, and also far-reaching and wide-reaching. Because currently, all the things that I've seen, great attempt, you know, especially the local initiatives, but they don't go far enough. And you'll find that most of them, they start from the most obvious place, which is let's donate money and equipment. But we go, need to go beyond that. And one of the findings that we've, we've come up from the six from the six weeks was that um, there are six areas of focus, right? By no means the, the only six, but it's a start, right? Equipment provisioning, let's continue, but continue both statically and strategically, right? That's number one. Tech support. Once you get those equipment in the hands of the child and the school teachers and the tech support staff, who is providing them with the support they need to be able to use that device? So that, that's another area. And thirdly, it's around uh, digital skills and online education, right? So there's two parts to it, right? If you don't have the skills, how can you use those e equipment wise? And we're talking about simple things such as being able to use Zoom or Office 365, you know, who's providing those skills for them, right? Fourth is around tech career opportunities. Since, you know, we are talking about digital world, lots of people are interested to get into the industry. And we, as the industry, we're also willing to help. How do we find a way to join them all up? Right, fifth obviously is around socializing, you know, communication, right? If this is worth talking about it, let's talk about it all the time because it's not a one-time thing. It's not like, you know, you know, we talk about getting a dog for Christmas, right? Digital divide as a topic has been around for a long time. If, I remember my first uh, 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 sort of familiarity with digital divide was in the early days as a, as a young graduate, I've heard about the digital divide by Sir Donald Maitland, right? He created a report all those years ago, back in what, 1970s, 80s? And we're still talking about it today. But the difference is this. The difference is that in this day and age, how can the UK, how can we as tech professionals not be able to solve this problem for at least young children in this country, to be able to get an equipment, to be able to get an education during this period when they are completely excluded for those who just have no means of doing that. So on that note, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, 
happy to contribute to this conversation on behalf of all those individuals and all those uh, communities that I'm part of. Thank you very much, Freddie. Great list of six areas <clears throat> of focus there. Freddie, what, what do you, well, I'll ask uh, all of you about this. Um, how do you make top down and bottom up work together? And, and what do you think about the idea of, um, you know, as Helen said, a, a sort of number 10 led initiative I mean, how do you, Freddie, let me start with you. How do you make the best of a series of bottom-up initiatives as well as top-down? I mean, I think Helen said, you know, we do, we've gone beyond, I'm paraphrasing, gone beyond let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, how do we do that, Freddie? What's your thought? So here, I mean, here is obviously my view and please, uh, please challenge me. Um, I, I'm going to start from the position that because I've invested in, in talking to many leaders, and many communities, hopefully that presents a view that is worth listening to, right? Now, what is clear is that if we don't do something about coordinating all those efforts, everybody will contribute to start from the most obvious phase that doesn't go far enough, right? Now, so what can we do to make sure that we always don't start from the beginning, right? Let's start from another place. Let's start, let's start from, in fact, I'd like to suggest, let's start from now, right? In terms of having done six weeks of, of, of work, let's have a bit more clarity around the signposting. <laughs> And what is clear to me is that if we continue to do this bottom-up thing without any top-down support, it's not going to go anywhere. So I welcome, for example, the fact that I came across the Digital Poverty Alliance. I think that is a fantastic umbrella as one of those places that allows us to join the dots, that allows us to, and by the way, from what I hear, and maybe Danielle can tell us more about the DPA, is that it creates now an umbrella that allows anybody who wants to do something to be part of it. So it, you don't have to go and join as whatever. You, just, you can be just part of it. So that's, that's one thing. But I do think, John, that as, as, as a professional body such as the BCS, you know, being the premier body for IT professionals, we have a responsibility to also help to steer these ships, right? Because there's a lot of people in our industry who's asking the same question, how can we help? And I think that one of the great things that BCS has done, and I think that will be a, a good way for it, just as a suggestion, is that BCS has a number of specialist groups. They are created to serve a need. And for those who, who, who are purposeful, obviously they will have a longer life. If not, they will disappear anyway. So I would think that one of the areas that BCS at least can do within its own community is to have a specialist group around digital property so that like-minded professional and members of BCS can use that as a way to connect up with other groups. Rather than me as an individual and many of us, by the way, as I said, those leaders I've spoken to, many of them are also BCS leaders, but we are all floundering on our own. We've no place to come together to have that conversation as a BCS body, for example. Danielle, thank you very much. Danielle, what, you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's quite a big, um, in a sense, Freddie's bigged you up in the parlance, the Digital Poverty Alliance. Uh, uh, is the alliance up for this? I mean, can it do that job? Absolutely. Well, we hope so. Yeah, I mean, it's still sort of embryonic, but that is absolutely what, what it needs to do. Um, just to give you a bit more background about it, the idea is to work collaborat collaboratively to, to address the, you know, that, that challenge, the, the digital poverty challenge, by bringing together organizations who either have expertise um, in digital poverty or they want to contribute to tackling that issue. But it's not about duplicating the work that's already being done. So it's about sort of trying to bring it together more than <coughs> duplicating that work. So, so the idea is that the Alliance invites organizations to become signatories and then they agree to a number of pledges. So we work together um, and we use the Alliance um, really like a hub for coordination um, to provide expertise and thought leadership. And I, I think, you know, Freddie's... Um, Freddie's so Danielle, how long do you think that's going to take in years to get all those groups together? Well, um, I don't know, actually, because there are so many people who, who want to do it already. So it's about, you know, this isn't about trying to sort of say, hey, do you want to do something new? This is about trying to find the people who are doing it already, who are very passionate about doing it already and going, right, here's a thing, here's an umbrella, like Freddie said, you know, to bring it all together. So it's, and if we can do that and get the message out, um, you know, collectively get that message out, then I don't think it should be years and years. So oh, um, don't, don't chip in everyone, otherwise it'd be chaos, please. So um, we'll, we'll take the questions off chat because we have got 170 people here. We'll take the questions off chat, and then with a bit of luck, we can do the old uh, put a hand up if we've got a bit of time at the end. But if you, if everyone starts shipping in, 
I won't be able to cope. I'll just cry or something. Um, that that was Daniel. Let me just ask you though. Um, yes, yeah, let's avoid the issue. Let's coordinating is great, but will there be any sort of top down? You know, like you do this, you do that. I mean, have you thought through that? From from the alliance itself, the top down. Yeah. yeah. Um, not at the minute. No, it's more about sort of trying to to gather that the 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 reason we. Well, part of the reason you want to do that really is to then make quite a strong voice with government. Yeah. Um, so, so that could be the sort of top down if you can have that voice with um, with government and, and other other bodies. And what do you think of Helen's idea of driven by number ten? Then you know a sort of national campaign or you know something like it. What are your thoughts on that? I think that would be great. Yeah. In addition to other things that are being done, but I think you know that that voice from a top down perspective that voice I think could be very very strong and, and Helen realistic that um number 10 have you had any indications from top yeah, levels so, in government at appetite for it yeah yes I have I, I I think that um the reason we're all sitting here and we're all interested actually is because the pandemic has really exposed and exacerbated digital exclusion <laughs> Um, and so it, it has for the, you know, 170 odd people on, on this session, but obviously for politicians as well. Um, the other thing is, is that um, DTMS obviously holds the policy um, ring for digital inclusion. But, um, Sorry, Helen, if anybody's not on mute, apart from our panellists, could you put yourself on mute, please? Paper rustling, it's the yeah. bane of Zoom, isn't it? Yeah, I'm carry on, Helen. Sorry. That'd be like someone was washing up to me. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. Well, that would be good. <laughs> um, so, um, because there's a number of different departments who are interested in this, then it then begins to think um, that you, you know, I, I, I get the I get the feeling that it's possible. I, I've, been, I've been reading some of the things in the chat, and someone said that they first read a book 20 years ago about the digital divide. Uh, well, I've been working in the digital divide for about 20 years. So um, that, uh, we, we, you know, we keep inching forward. And I think the thing is, we really have to make this strategically embedded into national um, policy. And it's not just about government. I think what I'm looking to the government for is that leadership yeah. and to say that this is about a coordinated plan. And that, you know, in the same way that, um, so um, the Andy Burnham in Manchester has said that Greater Manchester will be 100% digitally included. But then you've got to follow the up, that up with a plan. So how do you then coordinate? You asked about top down and bottom up. And I think the reason why I, I believe in that is because that's what we do day in, day out at Good Things Foundation. We work with thousands of grassroots organizations, some of them 100% volunteer led. Um, and we're also working at a national level a, across national and international policy around digital inclusion. And actually by having that knowledge of both, you can bring them together. I think, I think we're all agreeing here on the panel is that, that Yes, doing something small and making a difference to a few people's lives is important. So yes, definitely do that, you know, donate your one laptop. But actually, we've really got to think bigger. And the reason why, um, so I'm more hopeful now than I've ever been that we could have a digital inclusion strategy for the UK that actually is going to work. And when I say the UK, then it's probably four national plans um, because, because of devolution. Um, and I think that um, that some of the things that we've talked about, so um, that, that we're uh, working with Nominate on what's called a data poverty lab. So just honing in on that one piece about affordable connectivity. So affordable connectivity, such as um, social tariffs, but all, and also free connectivity, things like data banks. And again, because of the work that we've done throughout, we all have done throughout the pandemic, that is now looking possible in a way that 12 months ago it wasn't. The other thing is that, that the children is not my area, so that we focus on, on adults. We've been doing some work with families, so we've supported 20,000 adults and families with devices and connectivity and, and over 150,000 people with skills in the last year. Yeah. Um, but actually, we've just had a massive period where children have been learning online. And actually, John, you were joking about going back into the office. Do we expect now that children should just go back into the schools and just behave like they did before the pandemic? Right. Um, the, again, as I said, it's not my specialist area, but I went to a lecture about two years ago and they said if every single maths graduate 
in the country became a maths teacher, we still wouldn't have enough maths teachers, right? Surely in the last 12 months, it's been proven that children can learn online. So where is the discussion about hybrid and blended learning? Because actually, it's only when you have that kind of thinking, you then close the digital divide. Because if every child has to learn half of their maths online, then every child has to have a laptop and has to have access to the internet. Um, yeah. So it's about thinking about how do we make sure we embed this into proper yeah. post-pandemic thinking about how digital has changed our life in the last 12 years and how it should continue. We all talk about a new normal with a kind of slight smirk on our face, but we all know we're not going back to normal and neither should we. We've no. learned some things that are positive and we need to make sure that we take that into this ne next stage of our recovery. Really good points. Really good points there, Helen. So I'm going to turn to Dan Aldridge in the BCS team, give you the massive job, Dan, looking at 74 entries in the chat. Synthesize that into the, you know, give me what are one or two, what are some of the questions that are coming up, Dan? Can you see any sort of themes emerging? Yeah, so I've, I've had a look um, at uh, a lot of the comments and a lot of them actually Helen just um, expertly <laughs> um, covered quite a few there. I think there's been a lot of talk about um, local authorities, um, you know, Ma Manchester's been mentioned a couple of times as, as an area that is doing some very important bespoke work, um, but also um, it's Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I think uh, to, to Helen's point about how those four national um, data digital plans work is, is really important because you see you see increasing um, diversity in terms of the way that the different parts of the UK are going so that's been been raised I think um, the panel if we can especially you know I think it's interesting to hear from the IET on that one as well about how how they plan to foster that um, innovation um, another one that's come up is online harms and safeguarding so increasing this kind of um, increasing this access to tech in many ways to, to vulnerable young people, um, that it does increase potentially the, the prospect for harm um, and safeguarding issues that, and just thoughts on that would be welcome. Um, there's also some stuff around uh, problems of connecting those tech um, expertise with communities of need. So that seems to have come through um, a while. And I think this is probably goes back to the issue of um, why we do need some sort of government initiative that will coordinate this because it feels that government is probably one of the only organisations that has the scale to deliver. Um, and there's been, uh, the, you know, the talk about the role of teachers in driving skills and competency, which I think has been um, discussed. Okay, well, Dan, say, stop, say, them. <laughs> stop there and save some, yeah. see if any uh, anything else comes in. Let, let's, um, I'd like to pick up this point about uh, local authorities. You mentioned uh, Manchester, but, um, but uh, that was, Helen mentioned Manchester. But the uh, national plans from um, the other countries and regions of the of the united kingdom um, any any thoughts i mean danielle have you uh dealt thought about that do you know how you're going to deal with the different sub regions of the uk uh, we haven't from the iet um perspective at the moment um i'm you know with with my other hat on at the university of manchester we are liaising quite a lot with the city and with andy burnham's team etc um, and so the university is working and other universities, you know, Manchester Metropolitan, Salford, et cetera, you know, we're all trying to work together with that. Um, so not specifically at the moment through the, the Alliance, um, but I think that's just because it, it's so embryonic, you know, at, at the very embryonic stages, um, they would absolutely be, um, you know, a, a body that, that we'd want to get involved in this. Let me ask Helen then. I mean, certainly in other work I do, I see the importance of cities and metropolitan areas and, you know, region. You know, they, they can be quite powerhouses these days, can't they, Helen? I mean, what's your... Is Manchester the only one or are others doing anything? No, so, um, so Manchester, the thing with Manchester's Andy Burnham's actually come out and said it publicly that he wants 100% digitally included Manchester, Greater Manchester. Um, that in uh, West Midlands, they're very actively working on the digital inclusion um, strategy for the West Midlands. Um, I think this is where um, that uh, actually some sort of national coordination is helpful um, because that uh, 
and money's scarce. That there aren't any silver bullets here, but there are some things that can be common and can be commonly used. So, for example, you know, I, I believe that we need to continue to grow the national social infrastructure we have for informal learning to reach um, hard to reach adults. I mean, you know, to reach older people, homeless people, um, unemployed people in the way that the online census network does. And, you know, we're hoping to grow that in the next year if, if we can get support. So that making sure that you've got that hyperlocal network, but actually you don't need to coordinate a hyperlocal network in each area if actually there's one nationally coordinated. You just need to know that it's there and you need to know that, that you can support them. And so, you know, it's much more important, I would say, for um, metro mayors to be thinking about what, what's, what kind of grant programs do they want? What, what um, demographics within the population do they want to prioritise? Um, rather than building that social infrastructure, if that social infrastructure is already there, to kind of to support that so social infrastructure. Um, just on the nations, though, Scotland is definitely the forerunner. Um, you know that they uh, invested a lot uh, and a lot quicker um, for um, children and devices, as well as um, other other cohorts like um, care leavers and 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 other adults as well. Um, yesterday, as has already been said, Nicholas Sturgeon pledged every child in laptop to get a, uh, sorry, every child in Scot school aged child in Scotland to get a device or a tablet, um, a tablet or a laptop um, to help them with their learning if they get elected. Um, and I think that, I think I used the word zeitgeist before and I think that we have to recognize that this is, this is a, this is a, I was gonna say an open door, I probably should say a slightly ajar door um, <laughs> that is being pushed upon. And, it, and it's really only working out how do we make sure that we um, see that digital inclusion is a fundamental part of helping the million plus people who are going to be without work. Yeah. How do we see that this is a pathway for them um, to recovery? How do we make sure this is about, you know, the millions of older people who have been isolated and lonely during the pandemic? How do we make sure that digital inclusion is seen as part of the solution to make sure that we support them to, to support their um, uh, well-being, but also their health outcomes? How do we make sure that we're supporting children? So I think that seeing it as a in isolation, I think doesn't um, help us to make sure that we're creating the best possible plans. And I think that's actually where the Metro mayors, are, are, it's really helpful because they're thinking about how do we make sure we embed it across all of our different policy areas. So one of the things um, for people on the, uh, there are 163 participants, the BCS members, if you have any thoughts as to what BCS could do, given your experience of BCS, what you'd like to see BCS doing, Pop those in the chat and see if Dan can sort of synthesize them. We've had some great ideas so far, but we'd, I'd really like to hear um, from uh, any of the members who've got particular ideas as to things we should do. Freddie, I mean, I, I don't know if you would like to pick up on the local authorities point, but also I'd like to ask you, we haven't really talked much about in industry engagement, you know, organizations like Tech UK or um, the, uh, I don't know what the sort of, um, what the manufacturers organization of today is called in the UK, but what about companies getting behind this? And I don't mean just, you know, just leaning on BT to give us another few laptops or something, but what about uh, coordinated industrial engagement in this? I, I can share some specific examples. I've spoken with AWS, uh, Verizon, and those are great examples of big corporations who basically say the same thing. Uh, Amazon, for example, they donated 10,000 uh, Firefly tablets, right? And they say, look, but Freddie, that is very tactical, right? Yeah. It's a relief. But where is the strategic solution? They, as a company, they would like to contribute more strategically, but who is providing that signpost and direction and the conversation? So you can see, right, I'm, I'm hearing all this from everybody, from the individual. And by the way, I just want to acknowledge a lot of the great local initiatives out there already. Please continue to do what you do. For those who have not started and you want to do something, if you can donate one equipment to your neighbor, to your friend, to your teacher, please do so. Because I've seen in the chat, yeah, um, there are lots of things. This is a complex matter. It's not going to go away overnight. Mm -hmm. What is really important is to balance here and now versus something that would take a while to get there. And part of what, why I'm excited about the DPA is because I'm beginning to hear the right noises about what we should do in terms of visualizing where we want to go to. For example, the TPA says we want to imagine uh, ending digital poverty by 2030. I think that's still too far away, right? 
But what that meant is, for example, to, to give each child a laptop that they own, not to share, not a mobile device, but they yeah. own. So we need policies like this that are mm -hmm. so clear that then everybody else knows how to get involved to contribute. For example, I would love tactically to help the three schools in an office to just satisfy their need for 160 devices. Right now, it's only 100, only 100 monitors. But we're still scrambling to try and raise funds and knowing who to go to. And, and the big players are not interested in just the 10 or the 100. Yeah. yeah. Right? Doesn't have the impact at that scale, yeah. does it, for them? No. Um, Dan, I don't know if we've got um, any ideas now. I see we're over 99 comments. Any ideas for BCS? And can I just, uh, Dave Donahue, if you're still on the line, uh, still part of the Zoom, I'd like to, in a moment, give the floor to you, if I may, because I know I, I'm probably, there are probably others in the BCS community have also been champions, but I know you have an, in the um, in the Bristol branch as well. So David, I'd like to turn to you in a moment for your thoughts. But uh, Dan, um, anything else coming out? Um, so there's there's a hell of a lot of information. It's quite difficult to keep keep track of it. But I think yeah, the, that's the, why I asked you to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The main uh, the main uh, thrust I think of what's coming through is that. Um, it's the value of of the B, of organisations like the BCS and the IET because of that um, that's that breadth of, of of members and and their links to local communities, and it's um, I think it goes back to the um, the value of of the DP uh, the Digital Poverty Alliance as as a coordinating. Um, you know, organization to marshal a lot of this activity. So it, it you know, there's just um I've I've done some desk based research on on this over the past few months, trying to pull all the relevant bits together. And already I'm seeing a ton of stuff that I hadn't seen already before. And it's huge. So it's a it's a you know it's com even just this chat is comprehensive. Um I think it'll take I think we need to see this as a start of 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 um wider engagement as well. Um, because it's going to take some time to go through this and see what's what's yeah. happening. But um, I think okay. people that's, that's really good. wanting to donate, donating time, but it's actually people are very aware. And I think this is what's really great about um, members is that they're very aware of this is more than just donating devices. That is the big deal. And I think that's where we need to start, you know, that change. I mean, I know that it was um, it was a big kind of headline thing for Nicola Sturgeon to say every school child will have a, a laptop. And there, but there has to be more behind that, doesn't there? It does. Um, Dan, I cut you off earlier when you were talking about the role of teachers. Was there a particular point you wanted to make about that? Does that is that coming out quite a lot in the chat? Yeah, that was coming out a lot in the chat about um, how uh, it's about the skills that's really that is really lacking. So digital poverty, and this is I think Dave had to um, to jump out at four, but okay. it, the point that Dave um, makes very clearly is that this is um, very much about that digital capital, and it's about creating. You know, BCS and the IET um, can learn from from other organisations and can lead on this digital capital creation. Um, and I think that is really, really important. And part of that is how we do that in schools. So, you know, we've got the, the um, National Centre for Computing Education um, and, and other areas and, other, and we work with thousands and thousands of computing teachers to drive this. But I think what people are really wanting to know is how, how teachers and education can embed that. So it's that pedagogy piece. Thank you very much, Dan. That, that's really good. Well, listen, we're coming towards the end. We've got about um, 10 minutes uh, left. At this point, if anybody is desperate to throw a hand up and uh, chip in, um, because you've got a really good question that we've not covered or a good point to make, um, now is your now's the chance uh, to do it. But do throw a hand up if you want to. Um, I, I will, I mean, while we're waiting to see, um, Helen, What's your advice for me as president and your advice for BCS? What, because we've had a couple of conversations now, um, what, would your, what would your ask of us be? Um, so as BCS, I say you definitely should put as much pressure as possible on the government. Um, so on the prime minister, on the treasury, on DCMS, on DfE, I think that you should, you know, keep up that pressure and, and, and say that, you know, that, that you are looking to them for coordination 
You know, I think one of the problems that I often feel with government is that they feel that if they have, if they show some leadership, they then think they have to pay for it. Bill, but actually, yeah. this is not about them paying for everything. This is about them actually showing leadership in the way that we understand it, right? Um, so I think there's that one. The other thing, just actually reading the chat panel, John, is that um, something that, that someone asked is about where are, where are people physically, kind of geographically? And I think that... Um, that there may be something that is about how BCS really capitalizes that you have people across the country that understand the local um, area and the local initiatives that are going on. So one thing, for example, Good Things Foundation, we want to grow our network. We could have a coordinated, um, you know, coordinated role where BCS members could actually, you know, nominate and potentially even get in touch with local organisations to join the network, and then for them, it's free, by the way, for them to join the network and get get um, and get all of the um, benefits of being part of that network and being part of something bigger. So, so you know, to exploit that geographical coverage, I yeah. think would would potentially be be something that's very strong. I like both of those, Odai. I like. I'll say. In Try and say that properly, both of those ideas. Um, the, Grace, you were very bold and uh, put your hand up. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Grace, would you like to come in with your point or question? Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm based in um, South East London. And I'd just like to say that, you know, it can't just be about schools. Um, it's got about, it'd be about informal grassroots kind of community-based places. There's a lot of uh, young people who, you know, who are being affected the most do not have good times at school and don't get reached through school. They, they fall through the safety nets. And if you look at uh, a lot of initiatives and you think about representation of BME, it's really lacking and it's really disgraceful. And I think that if you, if there's more engagement with um, grassroots organisations who are got better representation, um, then we need to bring that area in as well. And, you know, I can't see how with this discussion, I don't see that. But I, I hope if anyone wants to reach out, they're welcome to. I've, I've been running Young Coders Meetup, 47% um, BME, about over 50% girls, um, another 25% um, 20, Asian. I, I separate BAME from BME. Because if you look at the figures, BME is really, really underrepresented. And uh, my, organ my group, it's youth led. So the kids run it themselves. They organize their projects, what they're doing. Young Coders Meetup, doing great, no funding. And it's not sustainable. And it's really um, a, a place where you, there is that bridging between, you know, us all, you know, because I work in FE. And, and the communities, and, and, and it's really difficult. You've got parents who are great, but there's some parents are not in the, in the position to be able to support their, their children, accessing amazing things that are there, co-clubs, whatever, but they're not in the position to understand and know about all this digital stuff. So there's lots of barriers, and there's people out there who can explain to you what those barriers are and have some answers but uh, are not really listened to very much. And I hope that changes, so yeah. thank you. I hope so too, thank you, great comment. And I saw in the chat that Dan would like to follow up with you uh, afterwards, that's really helpful. Um, we, we've got a, a few minutes left, maybe closing thoughts uh, from each of you, maybe in, as it were, in reverse order in that time on a tradition. So Freddie, uh, closing thoughts, remarks for, from you. Sure, uh, two, two comments. One for BCS, yeah. I think uh, yeah. John being the new president will be great to mobilize the members around those six areas because, you know, it's not just about equipment provisioning. The last area that I did mention was around <clears throat> governance, risk management and compliance. In other words, cyber safety, cyber essentials, those kinds of things that we as a tech profession, this is our area of expertise. We should make sure that we do something about that, right? Mm -hmm. And and two is to to give an example of something that is happening right now. So, I've done the six weeks of information collection, right? With a, a small community, which is the IT leaders communities. But now together with the, the, the DPA and also another organization called the Positive Transformation Group, that's three, right? They are doing a national survey just so that we understand the landscape of what is happening in this country, right? Because if we were to do it on our own, it would take a long time and we'll never see the full picture. So this is an example where if we start coordinating together, we stand a chance of hopefully seeing that landscape very soon, 
so that we can do something about how do we prioritize because this is not just about I started with school children, but there's a lot more. There's also the pensioners on the other extreme who is looking after them, who's making them a bit more digital savvy that allows them to get on board and do simple things, right? So broad, broad topic. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Freddie. Great observations. Uh, Danielle. Thanks. Um, well, um, you know, in terms of the DPA, I would love um, BCS to, to be more involved in that. I think, uh, you know, you have a very uh, diverse membership, which I think would be really useful um, for this. And, you know, with the IET members and BCS members, I think we can have a very strong voice there as well, you know, including all of the other um, institutions that, that we're uh, we're working with as well. Um, Grace, I would also love to follow up with you as well. I don't think from, from the DPA point of view, I think this is communities isn't, isn't an area where we've, we've actually looked at yet. Um, and so, so I'd love to see if there's the space in the DPA for communities as well. I think that would be great. So I'd, I'd really like to, um, if you could maybe, um, I'll get your details off Dan or someone, if that's okay, and, and follow up with you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Danielle. And, and Helen, final thoughts? Um, I think that, um, as I called it earlier, the, the door that's slightly ajar is I think we should seize the moment, seize the zeitgeist, and really believe that by working together, we can achieve something a lot more. You know, the person who in the chat panel has said that this has been around for 20 years, it has, yeah. but actually the texture of the digital divide has changed over those 20 years. You know, 20 years ago, computers were expensive and we needed to create places for people to go because nobody could afford a computer because it was like 1500 pounds and that was beyond the means of a normal family. And so um, that we've got to understand that, that, that that technology has changed, but so, but so have the societal issues. And that we can't just pretend it doesn't exist anymore because it has been so apparent and so exposed. I think that um, the fact that you can get 170 people on a webinar to, to listen and to contribute in the chat in such an active way, I think it means that within the BCS, there's clearly a lot of appetite for doing something. Um, again, I would say, let's make sure that it's, we. You know, I would love to work with you to make sure that it's coordinated. Completely agree with with Grace that that bottom that that grassroots. So you know, as we have with um, with online centres across the country, and so those hyper local organisations. So to um, steal a phrase that's very old now is, I think we need to you know think global and act local. Right? We've got to think about closing the digital divide, fix the digital divide, but then let's make sure that we're acting in a small way locally, but also in a joined up way so that we can really close this digital divide once and for all. Yeah, totally agree. Well, um, it's, it's been great to have all your contributions. L let me just reflect briefly on where I think we are then as BCS. So one of the things I wanted to do with all of these four areas that I described at the beginning and, you know, green IT, uh, diversity and in inclusion, professionalism, uh, and this topic of uh, digital poverty. I wanted to understand what the lie of the land was, um, and then then formulate the sort of how, as I said at the beginning, how can we best put our shoulder to the wheel in each of those areas? What can we do, working in partnerships with others? I mean, Helen, been working on this space for twenty years, and Freddie, your personal enthusiasm. I mean the world needs champions like you so thank you very much for that and we we absolutely respect that and we want to do our bit with you but at the same time we do need to work out what we can do and that's what we'll do over the course of the next few weeks so don't think this is a one-off event and then you know we'll move on to the next shiny thing not at all this is about now formulating how we can best uh, put our shoulder to the wheel and and uh, that you can tell from dan's comments in the team back at base i'm sure and his enthusiasm uh, we, we've, we're very enthusiastic to do this. And I think, I mean, to your point, Helen, I've been around this sort of tech and tech advocacy space for quite some time as well. And I've seen this issue over many years, but life has changed, hasn't it? I mean, it's such a, an integral tool to the way we, you know, work, live and play to, you know, in that old advert. I mean, but it really is. It is so um, intrinsic to what we all do now. So to be excluded from it, I mean, it's always been bad, but now it's, you know, it's life threatening. So, you know, we, it's really, really important. And I do hope that I have no 
acknowledge myself that the door is ajar, a but it would be madness if it wasn't. I mean, come on, you know, absolute madness. So uh, we're, we're, we will definitely do our bit. And I'd like to thank you all for your contributions to help us work out the lay of the land. And also the 99 plus comments in the chat, that would be absolutely invaluable. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to the panelists. And I'm only sorry you're not here to hear us all give you a fantastic round of applause. But anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And um, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully follow up with you in due course. Thank you. Thank you.